Welcome back, everyone. Uh, so uh, I'll be pre presenting the last module on you know, downstream analysis and integrative tools. So the uh, the objectives of uh, the, the the lecture this afternoon will be first to explore some of some types of downstream analysis that can be done with epigenomic assays. Although Misha uh, uh, already uh, already went into some some parts of that uh, yesterday at the. Uh, at the, uh, the assignment at the end of the day. Uh, we'll also cover uh, sources for publicly available data sets that anyone can use in their own projects, either for a full analysis on, on public data sets or like to compare to, for example, their own data set that they produce in the, within their team. And we'll also cover uh, online portal tools that can help you with stuff such as uh, data analysis and like offering uh, tools uh, to do sometimes the, the same kind of thing that you've been doing from the command line and so on. We'll, we'll come back to that. So uh, first of all, we'll talk about the downstream analysis uh, um, tools. And then we'll move on to a public data set, uh, ways to control uh, the quality of the uh, online data sets that you, that you download. And then we'll move on to online visualization and analysis tools. And finally, we'll give you a short introduction to the Galaxy web-based platform. So, yeah, there, and then, uh, I'll tell you in advance, I realize that there's a lot of stuff in the presentation here. So, some, maybe the more, uh, uh, the, the more advanced concept, I'm, I may go a bit over uh, quickly, because I, I, I would like at the end of the lecture to have a bit of time to give you a, a kind of live demo to the, uh, the Galaxy uh, web interface that might help you for the, uh, the lab part that will come after. So, uh, yeah, downstream functional analysis, first point. Um, well, this is like the, the, the focus of the whole workshop, but mo motivation for epigenomic integrative analysis is like, so yeah, we you know that genes account for only 2% of the genome, so that means that like 98% of the genome does not encode for protein sequences. However, 76% of the genome gets tra transcribed in some kind of ways and nearly half of the genome is accessible in some ways to uh, transcription uh, of machinery and, and, and so on. So like by putting into context uh, information that we get from uh, DNA methylation, uh, ChIP-C for histone modification, transcription factor with, uh, with RNA, uh, transcription with RNA-seq, chromatin accessibility and so on, we can uh, at least hope to ease our understanding of the underlying bi biology. So what we've seen so far in the workshop is that we've seen different softwares and tools to uh, do primary data analysis for ChIP-seq and methylation. And what we get at the end of that uh, is, for example, in the case of ChIP-seq, a set of peaks, so uh, often represented as, a, as, as, as bed files, which tell you like on the genome where are the, the, the peaks that were identified. In the case of uh, uh, methylation, we get uh, methylation level at different sites, CPG islands or C CPG specific sites all across the genome. So next we can use this data to run some functional analysis tools by comparing, for example, uh, different regions in one specific data set or like multiple samples of the same group or uh, samples across different groups such as case versus control and so on. So Guillaume talked to you about that uh, this morning, but like, for instance, in the case of methylation, we can look at differentially methylated sites uh, across groups of individual case, uh, mouse working? Yeah, okay. cases versus controls, and, uh, and then we can look either at specific sites or we can look at groups of sites or CPG islands or so on that, that, that seem to behave in, in, in similar ways and, and so on. Uh, this, this graph is from the, uh, the uh, roadmap, uh, if I may say, a flagship paper, which was looking at the methylation patterns of different regions of the genome, whether it's like transcription uh, uh, start sites uh, for genes or like uh, all other than like G, uh, intron as exons and so on, and like realizing with a high number of samples and those things that like, yes, structure, transcription uh, start site seems to be 
less methylated and more accessible to transcription machinery and so on. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is uh, uh, motifs. So like, what are uh, DNA motifs? Uh, there are recurring patterns in the, in the DNA that like we think at least <laughs> may, may have a biological function. So um, often when you have these, these, uh, these little patterns of DNA across your genome, you can expect that uh, maybe some uh, transcription mechanism can bind to it and start translating the uh, DNA into, uh, into uh, transcribing the DNA into RNA. And so like in the example I have here, if I look at this uh, potential uh, transcription, uh, this, this uh, uh, specific uh, DNA motif, uh, and if I, uh, if, if I search for this in, uh, in, in my, uh, my result file, and I allow for one base mismatch, then I can realize that like, I have this, uh, this motif <coughs> at several places in the genome. So uh, that's allowing, for example, here I have a one-to-one -one match, but like in the case, in this case here, I have like a one, uh, this one here, one letter mismatch. So like, um, because like motifs which to which like uh, uh, transcription factors might, might bind to are not necessarily matching one-to-one -one every of the bases of my motif. So like by having a software that looks at like, allow a bit of a mismatches in those things, I, I'm, I'm more able to identify sites uh, that, that, that may interest me. So yeah, exploring motifs in Gypsy data using uh, the, uh, the P files that we, that, that we generated out of the, uh, the, 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 the pipelines that we talked about uh, yesterday. Uh, we can try to ident identify such motifs. So uh, we talked a lot about chip seek in the, con in the context of identifying uh, histone tail modifications, which may or may not uh, <coughs> enable uh, transcription. There's also a, a chip seek that can be used in the context of a transcription factor binding site. So, like for example, if I'm if I'm looking for one specific transcription factor, and I I, I may I may uh, use an antibody to bind to, to, to this specifically and try to see in the genome where it binds. And then using the peaks that I get from the uh, ChIP-seq experiment, then I can identify where my, my motif might be uh, doing something. So there's a uh, software to, to do that that's called Homer. We will uh, run that in the, in the lab part at the end of the afternoon. Uh, so what it does is it's uh, using a multi motif discovery algorithm to uh, identify either known motifs, because uh, Homer has its own database of uh, known motifs across the genome. It tries also to identify like, the novel mo uh, motifs based on the, the, the list of known motifs that it has. And uh, that's it, it generates H nice HTML reports with like the graphics and those things and like the confidence that it has on the, on the identified uh, motif and so on. So that's the command that we will use this afternoon to, uh, to run that on, a, uh, on the ChIP-seq data set that we will uh, download from the ENCODE the web, uh, website. So what Homer takes as a parameter is uh, first a bed file, that the bed file uh, that they, uh, yeah, Misha presented you yesterday. Is, uh, I'm, I'm just giving you a, a, a short description of what it is here, but it's a text file with several columns, first one being uh, the chromosome and then the start position of your of your feature, the end position of your feature. When I talk about a feature, it's like, so you have this bed, uh, this bed and like each line <coughs> in the bed file describes that there's something specifically starting at this position and ending at this position uh, at one place on the genome. So like a, a, a bed file will list the peaks, so like the, the regions which are, uh, which have been identified in, in experiments. So by providing to Homer this bed file in a reference genome assembly, it can uh, it can look for the motifs which are uh, interesting for me. And this color is only applicable to chipset, or is it also applicable to DNA methylation? It's for chips. It's for chips. So uh, the execution step. Well, I'll go, I'll go through, uh, quickly over that. I like it's assessing the quality of the bed files. It's uh, uh, extracting the sequences. So, like my bed file doesn't contain any. Uh, 
any information on DNA bases and those things. It just has information about location. I know that there's something starting there and ending there on my genome, so I need a reference genome to get the sequences which are described by this best file. And then calculate the, C the CG, CPG uh, content of peak sequences. We parse the genomic sequences of selected sites, randomly select a background modification for motif discovery. That's interesting because, like we mentioned, randomly, that means like, like from one execution to the other, you might get slightly different results. So just keep that in mind when you do the lab later that it doesn't look exactly like the screenshot. And yeah, that's it. So it let, then it checks for known and uh, the novel motifs. And it gives you a report that looks uh, basically like that. So this motif uh, we know for the, the, the first letter for, sh for sure is a T. And then this, this, the second base of my motif is either a G or an A. Most of the time it's a G, but like, uh, uh, yeah, so you can see with, with the size of the letters, you can know like how, uh, how likely, uh, how often you will find one specific base in that motif. Uh, the next thing is uh, looking for a uh, gene ontology uh, enrichment. So yesterday, Misha presented uh, uh, David, and uh, and David will present you a uh, great. <laughs> so uh, uh, yes, so yeah, I'll, I'll talk to you about <laughs> about about great uh, uh, this afternoon using the peak files. So. Um, yeah, as I'm saying we're looking for gene ontology, which are a set, a set of uh, structured, controlled vocabularies for all kinds of stuff, such as uh, uh, like uh, biological processes, uh, phenotype, diseases, and so on. So I'll just talk quickly about grateful. So, like what 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 they're saying, why they're claiming that they're like better than other tools, although like I don't know to which, which extent <laughs> this is a. Uh, this is true, like nowadays, but uh, uh, so that like gray doesn't necessarily just look at the region that's just next to uh, the, the the feature that, that you're describing, but it's looking uh, a lot more after and a bit a bit more before the region in order to try to widen its, its horizon of, uh, of potential feature uh, ontologies uh, describing your uh, your feature. And uh, yeah, maybe I'll just skip over this. This is like describing two uh, two methods that we can be using to uh, to identify uh, uh, descriptors. So uh, the input of grade, well, you give it a uh, a bed file with the, the, the region of interest. Um, the output will be the matching gene ontology terms, such as I was saying, like molecular function, biological processes, phenotypes diseases and so on. So you'll get one table for each of these categories with like uh, the top rank uh, in order of a, of a of matching score. So like the, the top one being the more the most uh, potentially interesting. Uh, of course look at the uh, look at the scores uh, before determining that this this, this uh, gene ontology is really describing your data set. So um, this is just an example for H3K27AC peaks from a bone marrow sample where we see that it's a bit small, but like uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, of terms which seem to be matching to immune response, immune system, and these kind of things, which like potentially make sense. So uh, uh, it seems to be working well in this situation. Uh, and then I'm just giving a couple of more examples coming from the, 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 the roadmap paper where uh, for integrative analysis, where in this case, we're using um, genome-wide uh, identified SNPs and to uh, like co comparing to, to chip seek data to, to try to identify in the case of a, a, a wide range of diseases and different cell type, if, if there seems to be a correlation between specific SNPs and uh, chip seeker outcome, and uh, yeah, another example here for for methylation data. For for example, to say, so depending how far I am from my transcription uh, starting site in the gene, uh, the level of methylation and the, the, these kind of things. So, uh, my my next section is on uh, working with public data sets. So, there's a lot of uh, sources online where you can download 
data sets which are publicly accessible to anyone. You can download these and start going on your studies on a wide array of uh, cell types, uh, diseases, other, uh, based on other type of conditions or phenotypes. Uh, yeah, these resources are free. You can do whatever you want with it, but uh, as others have mentioned before me, uh, you usually should assess for the quality of the files because like not all of the public accessible data sets are at the, uh, the expected level of quality, if I may say. Uh, one, maybe one of the, f the first uh, large-scale projects was uh, the, uh, the roadmap project, which is not, has now been over for a couple of years. But uh, it, uh, it provides such uh, like, um, uh, uh, like lots of data set, many samples run over different types of, of a human and other species issues. Uh, on, uh, on things such as a uh, whole genome by sequencing, uh, chip seek, uh, and other types of assays. Bayesian Code Consortium website. When uh, you, if you look at, at the uh, in your binders or, or in the online slide, I, I put under the uh, each picture the, the URL where you can access uh, the, the sites if you're interested. Uh, so the encode, which is uh, starting now, it's 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 fourth phase of uh, the data production, and they have this. Uh, this website where you can download uh, uh, all types of uh, epigenomic data sets as well. And then there's the uh, the GTEx projects. With, with the, this one specifically, its aim is to try to find a relation between SNPs identified in the genome uh, in comparison to uh, in, in relationship with the uh, uh, gene expression. So the URL is here. And there's also IHEC, which is like right now the uh, the main uh, epigenomic effort worldwide. Basically, it's a consortium of, uh, of consortia. There's uh, many groups uh, producing data on, uh, on different kind of uh, human and others' tissues on, on different kind of dis diseases. So there, there's, a, there's a strong also disease component on the, the data sets produced with an IHEC. So in Canada, we have the, uh, the CERC effort, which is uh, uh, producing uh, uh, such type of data sets in the US we have a, a we, we used to have a, a roadmap and there's a code in, in the Euro Europe we have uh, the blueprint project which just finished last year and who produced a major in, in majority uh, uh, blood samples and, so on. and then we have a uh, deep in Germany uh, we have the a, a Japan and a Korean project and, and So what is IHEC? Uh, its, goal is, its goal is to provide uh, standardized uh, reference epigenomes for different kind of normal and disease tissues. So the, one of the main, uh, uh, the main ideas behind this is, is to have these, uh, these committees working on, different, on establishing different kind of standards on all kinds of aspects for data production. One being uh, the assays to, to create these data sets and to analyze these data sets uh, bioinformatically afterward. Uh, there's a group for like data distribution and metadata uh, organization and so on. There's a, there's a work group on ethics. On it, uh, there's a new one on uh, starting on integrative analysis for, for these data sets and so on. So when I talk about a, a reference epigenome produced by IHEC, I'm talking about, uh, uh, so, so to have a full reference epigenome, you need a, a whole genome bisulfide sequencing data set. You need an RNA-seq transcript, uh, assessing the transcriptome for, for your data set. And you need a chip-seq assays run on six different histone modification, histone tail mod modifications. So like one data set usually means like one samples. In some cases, we have pools of samples for, for this as well, but uh, in, in all those cases, it's like it's it's for this sample or this <coughs> sample. All of these assays are being run, uh, and then it can give you a, a a more integrative approach to that, that that you can use to analyze one specific sample to answer your questions. So the data data integration strategy and, and sharing strategy within AHEC uh, will basically look like this. So we have all of these. Uh, different consortia member, member of, of IHEC producing this data. Uh, first of all, it, 
they're uh, producing uh, the raw data, which is uh, the FASTQ that we just explored uh, uh, in depth yesterday. So these are the raw uh, sequences for whole genome by surprise sequencing, chip seq, and RNA seq, and so on. This raw data is not accessible uh, directly, uh, like it's not open to the public because there's all kinds of, uh, among other things, ethical considerations like. Uh, Many participants wouldn't want just their, their DNA to be in the open on, on, on the internet. So usually this data is stored at controlled access such as uh, EDA, DBGAT, DBJ in Japan, and, and, and so on. So to access this data, it's possible to anyone. It's po possible for anyone to access this data. It's just that you need to uh, prepare an official request describing your project describing what you're going to do with the data and you have to have a, a, a an academic institution backing you uh, on, on this research and you have to agree to a, a whole lot of terms about what you can and cannot do with the data and those things once and so you apply through this process and then you get access to the raw data that you can download to start your analysis so of course that's the most interesting data set I think because like this is the raw data, and you can analyze it in any kind of way you want. But uh, as a kind of shortcut, so uh, each of these groups have their own standardized processing pipelines. Right now, like many, I, most IHEC members have their, their own pipelines, which differ in different kind of ways. And we're gradually working on standardizing these kind of things to have a results which are gradually getting more comparable. But like, it, this is to say that the process data that get output out of that is this uh, is uh, available on the uh, on the open. So the uh, the it's the site where you can download this data set is uh, the the IHEC data portal. You can uh, navigate, and we'll, we'll cover that later in the in the workshop. But uh, it's the place where you can down, uh, download uh, search for the uh, your data sets of interest and download the peaks or the uh, the methylation sites and uh, methylation level for different sites on the genome and so on. And whoops, yeah, that pretty much covers it. So that brings me to the IHEC data portal. Uh, the goal of the portal is to uh, make available and, and discoverable the public data sets produced by the different IHEC members. So again, raw data is in control access repositories, but the public data that you can visualize and start analyzing right away is available on the IHEC data portal. Uh, so as of November 2016, where we currently have like uh, uh, about 10,000 human data sets, uh, 200, about 230 in mouse and primates, and uh, about 290 full reference epigenome. So like that's with all of the assays that I'm, I'm talking about, uh, I, I talked about earlier. And there's uh, currently eight consortia which have data sets on that side available so far. And so the portal offers tools for discovery, visualization, and pre-analysis. We'll come back to that. Um, and I, I explained that already, but like the, the, this difference between controlled access data and, and, and public data. Controlled access data is the raw data from the sequencer, but it also includes things such as phenotypes and clinical or sensitive information that that patients wouldn't want to be uh, just out in the open and they're archived at control access repositories. So the public data on the other hand you can just start visualizing on things such as the UCSC genome browser, uh, Ensemble, IGV. You'll see in the workshop later in, in, in the lab part we will download some of the some of these public data sets and we'll still manage to do some interesting things out of with, with these. So th this also includes uh, metadata that's not, that makes some uh, uh, participants not directly identifiable. Uh, so information sometimes that like uh, uh, the, the, the donor sex, uh, maybe an age range, uh, uh, a, a disease if it's not too, too specific uh, to uh, directly identifiable, like for rare diseases and those things, and it's really available. So assessing for uh, quality controls of uh, online resources. Uh, as we mentioned many times so far, the data sets have a different level of quality. Uh, the quality, therefore, of the data set that you download uh, should be assessed. 
there's different kind of ways to do that. One of the one of the ones that we've touched the most in this workshop is to use FastQC. So if you download the FastQs from a controlled access repository, for instance, you can you can run FastQC on it, and you you'll have an overall idea of the quality of the data sets you get. Uh, there's other things that you can do. I'm I'm putting at the bottom here an example of like a, a same. Uh, same data producer, same type of assay, but two different samples. And then you have one uh, for ChipSeq, and then you have one where you have really like a clear uh, piece, while the other one has a lot of background noise, which makes you like uh, realize that maybe there's something, something, <laughs> something going on, something's wrong there. Uh, there's there's other ways like you can simplistic, but like uh, uh, just comparing signal to noise ratio in 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 your uh, in your ChipSeq data, for example. The, Percentage of uh, of uh, per percentage of, of reads in your chip seek that match to peaks that were identified, and those kind of things can be the other kind of things that can be done. Uh, so there's also online resources which can help you a bit with, with that. Uh, for example, in the IHEC data portal, there's this. Uh, this Pearson correlation test that's that's being run uh, over like all all of the tracks which are archived by the portal, and it, it can generate you these uh, these these matrices, these kind of heat maps uh, that that will uh, cluster data set about, about based on their similarity. Um, there's also uh, currently in the uh, IHEC ACI standard working group, there's a, a set of QC metrics that's uh, getting uh, that's gradually getting set, and, and, and people are gradually starting to generate uh, QC metrics on the data set that they, that they uh, release. And then these metrics will be available within the, meta, within the metadata, and then people who download the data sets will be able to, to, to have a, an overall idea of the quality of the data sets that they use. Uh, I just wanted to talk uh, quickly about Chrome Impute, because like, that's a much more involved way to, to, to assess quality of, of, of data set, but one, one that's existent uh, nonetheless. So Chrome Impute allow, uh, basically allows you to um, impute missing signal tracks. So let's say you have a whole bunch of, of samples uh, on which you run ChIP-seq uh, experiments. And then in the case of some sample, maybe, I don't know, uh, just inventing a story, but like just say you didn't have enough uh, material to run uh, the, the, the sixth uh, uh, ChIP-seq histone mark assay. So like you're missing one data for, 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 this, for this sample. So like if you have other samples with uh, similar conditions, such as uh, I don't know, same, same cell type and those things like that, the other assays have been done with for the other similar samples, you can use Chrome Impute to uh, kind of impute the missing track of a the, the missing signal track for for the sample, so but like so this is interesting, but it's, it can also be interesting for a in a QC perspective. So like if you have many samples which are supposed to be similar, uh, you can try to impute a track uh, for 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 your data set, even though you have the original, and then you compare the original to the imputed track, and it can give you an idea how uh, like. If it's not similar at all, then, uh, at all, then maybe there's something wrong with the track you, you're looking for. This tool has been used for, uh, uh, has been created, I think, specifically for the, the roadmap project, and it's now uh, available. But it's very computational and computationally intensive, and takes a while to run. So. Uh, next, uh, online visualization and analysis tools. So, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll cover many online resources here. Uh, first, I'll talk about data discovery and download tools, uh, such as the IHEC Data Portal, the Encode Portal, the GTEx, and, and, and the Blue. Uh, then we'll go to uh, data visualization with UCC Genome Browser, Ensemble, and, and the WashU Browser. And then I'll, I'll talk about Galaxy. Is there any questions so far? Yes. Yeah. So, which You're asking which which data. Uh, which is the fact, like, database is used for doing geo analysis? Uh, 
uh, you well you mean so the on like the, the tool the tool, the online tool that we did see let's so they, they have their their own database in the back you're asking on what yeah. on was the what was used to create these databases uh, like uh, like for example if you go to a geo website they have their, their own database like which you can download and use it with some other packages or other tools mm -hmm. or there is databases from broad institute access uh, so I, I, I'm also like does it use what it is in user database it, it's a good question I, in the case of in specifically in the case of Gray, I will use it this afternoon. I, I don't know where what was used to uh, okay, to, to, to create this. And like, can you specify uh, if you want to analyze to a particular hierarchy, like number three, third level or fourth level, uh -huh. or does it like have used the whole hierarchy? Ah, uh, ah, uh, uh, which level does it put? I think it's on the whole set of, uh, of gene, uh, gene ontology, but yeah. Yeah, we can, maybe we can take that out after we do it. Uh, okay, so yeah, going back on the, uh, on the IHEC data portal, so that uh, this is basically what you'll get when you, when you log in uh, for the first time. So you have this interface where you can uh, select for the, o the whole IHEC and for a desired uh, a reference genome, uh, all of the data sets which are available per consortia, uh, these are the consortia as members of IHEC, one more time, and, uh, or by a, a tissue category or by type of assays. If you're looking specifically for ChIP-seq data sets, for instance, you might want to uh, select the, the histone uh, uh, pie chart. So like these charts are selectable, you, you click them and to, 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 to say what you want to to see, and then you can click on view selected, and it will bring you to the grid, the grid which lo which looks like this. So basically, this is a b a, a bi-dimensional well a, a grid, <laughs> which 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 uh, presents you all of the available data sets with an IHEC per uh, per cell type and per uh, per assays, and there's filtering criteria on the side uh, to help you decide what you want to see at any given time. And uh, so all of the, the tools, um, and, uh, I mean, the, there's a lot of external tools which are linked to the IHEC portal that more, more are coming, but like uh, currently, for example, you can visualize tracks in the UCSC genome browser. So like if you want to visualize <coughs> all of these data sets here, you can just click on them and click on visualize in genome browser and that will open the UCSC genome browser. It yeah, will allow you to browse through all of these tracks at once. There's also uh, what, uh, what I was talking about before, the uh, correlation uh, tool of the, of, of the IHEC portal. So basically you, you select the data sets that you want and it will give you a clustering of your data. So like you can see how similar data sets that you selected are to each other. So for example, if you choose uh, a group of sample which are, have been uh, which are the, of the same cell type and like in all kinds of similar conditions and you look at different type of, uh, of uh, chip seek uh, histone marks uh, you, you should expect that uh, like uh, uh, repressor marks should cluster a bit more together uh, like uh, enhancer mark uh, activator marks should, should uh, uh, cluster more together and, and, and so on so th this is a way to assess a, a bit the, the, the quality of the data and there's a there's a way on the side here to uh, navigate the available metadata for all of these samples. You can see this distri distribution by a whole lot of meta metadata terms. You'll see that in the lab. So this, as well. would I need to download it on my, the data on my computer, or can I, can I load my data online? Okay, so um, this is an online tool only, so it's from a, from a web browser. At the moment, it's only for IHEC data. But if, if you want to compare your, your own data next to the IHEC data, there's a feature coming for that in the IHEC data portal. Hopefully, by the end of the year, this is something that you'll be able to do. So yeah, I'm giving an example here for uh, for roadmap data, where I can see, for example, that my uh, uh, for the same samples, my enhancer uh, histone marks cluster well with my my other activators, and my repressors cluster well with my other repressors. Uh, you can also uh, download the uh, tracks 
uh, individually with, with, with the download tool. There was a button at the bottom of the grid. So like you select the tracks that interest you, you click on download, it will give you this kind of a directory where you can download the tracks of interest. Uh, the tracks are now uh, hosted directly on the portal server so that, that enables people to, uh, to, to that, that enables uh, like kind of pro protecting against stuff such as disappearing tracks and disappearing data sets over time. So consortia are coming and going. Uh, when a project is finished, you don't always know what will happen with the data and those things. So now data is permanently archived in the Ahek data portal. It can also uh, generate sessions. So like from the, the grid, the things that you select are, uh, you, you can just create a session out of that which will generate a report of the samples with like all of the uh, metadata that's available for each of the samples. So like uh, this is something that can be used for uh, sharing, for citation purposes or, or so on. And finally, there's a web API which gives you in JSON format Docu uh, documents with all of the available metadata for your samples. I don't know if you're uh, if you're uh, familiar with the JSON format, but it's like it's more like a, it's more made as a kind of machine readable format, but that's also very human readable as well, right? You have like a whole bunch of hierarchical kind of tree of keys and values. So like I can see that uh, for this specific experiment, analysis attributes are regrouped here. Uh, and then I have the, the tracks for this data set, and then I have uh, information on experimental attributes, sample, the, the sample attributes, uh, the donor attributes, and, and, and so on. Moving to the ENCODE portal. So uh, like not, not that long ago, like uh, the ENCODE revamped their website, and now they have this, this kind of neat grid with a lot of filtering feature based on all of the available metadata on the ENCODE portal. One thing to mention, so uh, ENCODE is also a, a member of IHEC, and some of ENCODE's data is available on the IHEC portal. However, the, uh, one of the main challenges, I would say, of the, uh, of, of, of I, the IHEC data portal and of IHEC itself is the, is the fact that like, it's many different groups producing data in different kind of ways and trying to harmonize things as much as possible, but like, we're still not at a point where like metadata has been defined like in the exact same way across all sites. So sometimes it's 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 difficult to compare samples because you have a lot of missing information, like little holes here and there. Uh, like uh, you're looking for samples with a specific donor sex and a specific disease, and like things have not been entered in the exact same way. So like there's a lot of needed manual curation to make things fit together. Although there's a lot of work in, within IHEC right now to try to harmonize these things. And it's already a lot better than it was like maybe, a, I would say even a year ago. So, and it's, it's gradually improving. But so the data from ENCODE, of course, is produced uh, by one data coordination center. So like the, the, the metadata as well is really neatly organized. And there's a lot of filtering criteria on the portal to decide what you what you see and what you don't. So you can uh, select the data set that interests you in the grid, and once you can also uh, uh, visualize those tracks uh, on UCSC Genome Browser, on the Ensemble Browser, and uh, yeah, that, that, that's it. But again, it's, it's strict, this one is strictly for ENCODE data. Uh, there's also this, uh, I like the, the, the GTEx portal that I've talked about before just because it's, it's, it has a lot of a neat uh, web 2 or 3.0 uh, 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 visualization tools which gives you all kind of information on the available data sets. Uh, so I invite you to have a look if you're interested. <coughs> and uh, finally, there's, uh, there's Deep Blue, which was uh, uh, made by the, the Deep uh, Consortia in, in Germany as, as, as a member of uh, yeah, the IHEC Consortium. So um, Deep Blue, uh, um, to be opposite of uh, IHEC Data Portal, well, the, the, where the goal is to download a like, whole data set and those things, Deep Blue offers you different kind of tools to select regions of the data sets that you want so that you don't have to download the whole thing locally to it. To your computer or to your server, so it offers you like different features such as a filtering of on metadata, region attribute, DNA sequence motif, and so on. Allows like a binning, pattern matching operation, group operations, and so on. So if you're interested, I, I invite you to have a look. They even have 
a uh, an R interface which can connect to the portal. So you, if you prefer to to uh, to access the data uh, y using R, well, there's there's a there's a full fledged API. There's a paper that was published like uh, I think a couple of months ago describing how to use it, and it, then you can like uh, bring the data much more easily without having to download the whole data set. You just the region that interests you for the subset of of of, the, uh, of sample that interest you and you can continue your analysis using r uh, okay others have talked have talked about it, about it before but the, the, there's a for visualization there's the ucsc genome browser uh, which basically is it, well it, it it displays all kinds of tracks but like as a lot of the, uh, the data sets for epigenomic are expressed in uh, at least the public data sets are, are expressed in uh, in formats that we call like big beds and big wigs. Uh, we've talked a lot about beds so far. So big beds is just a binary indexed version of the bed, of bed file. So like if you open it in a text editor, you you won't be able to see it directly. But it's made to be uh, to be much more uh, mu to to be open, open much faster on, for example, resorts online resources such as. Uh, the UCSC genome browser. So, like, if if a server has a specific track in big bed format, and I see it in the UCSC genome browser, uh, the browser doesn't need to download the whole track in order to be able to display it. It will just look for the re for the region I'm looking at right now and just download just just the amount of, of information I need to see all these tracks. And that makes it that it's possible using the UCSC genome browser to visualize a whole lot of track at once. Otherwise, it would take forever just to transfer the information uh, to the browser. So. so the just in case uh, you're, you're curious, that's uh, maybe a bit more technical, but the way that uh, data gets displayed in the UCSC genome browser is like, Groups who want to publish their data. So, like, let, let's say you 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 prepare uh, bed files and wiggle files, and, and then you create big beds and big wigs. How do, how can you have them integrated in the USCC genome browser to for like your paper publications or for to to uh, to share with the collaborators and those things? Uh, well, there, there's a way using like USCC genome browser track hubs. Uh, <coughs> so it's the, the only inconvenience, like it, these are text documents, so like you need to uh, to create these documents basically, and it, it, it tells the browser how to display them in, in the browser. So like uh, uh, how how large should the track be, uh, what 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 kind of a uh, what kind of metadata I have around the sample and those things. So I, I'm I'm giving a small example here, like so one track, and then you define its type, and you say you, you tell the the UR, URL where the uh, where the track is located, and then you give it a label and these kind of things. And, and by defining these documents, you can just share the link with collaborators who can load it in the UCC Genome Browser and other tools and start visualizing. Another vis uh, data visual visualization tool is the Ensemble Browser, which, uh, well, it has its own set of unique features. This one and the UCC Genome Browser have a lot of features in common, but this one is being uh, developed by the, uh, the EBI in, in Europe, and uh, it also supports UCC Genome Browser Track Hub. So, like, if you generate a Track Hub, or if you get a Track Hub coming from the IHEC Data Portal, from the Encode Portal, and so on, you can plug it in the Ensemble Browser and, uh, and, and use it as well. And UCC Genome Browser Track Hubs are also supported by the WashU epigenome browser. So this one is, it's, it's a really cool uh, uh, website too. I think like a, we're offering all kinds of, of features which are very specifically uh, tailored for epigenomic data sets. And uh, recently it started supporting bit, uh, big bed files as well. So it's getting gradually being able to display everything that's in the UCC genome browser track hubs on the, the, the WashU website. The, the URL for this one is available at the bottom too. Uh, okay, so th the last thing I want to talk about is, I'll, I'll have a, a, a more detailed section after, but uh, uh, the uh, data analysis using Galaxy. So uh, Galaxy is this web-based framework which offers a, a, a user-friendly interface to do a lot of the bioinformatics analysis 
that traditionally you'd be doing from the common line. So, so far we've been using all kinds of common line tool typing stuff, waiting for results and those things. And it's, uh, so it, and it works good and it, it, it's fine for, for people who are like maybe a, a, a bit less keen on using the common line or like maybe less used to this kind of, uh, of interface. Uh, Galaxy offers all kinds of, uh, of tool with like a clickable uh, parame uh, parameters that you can select in an interface. It makes things uh, very easy to, uh, to use. So like that, that's why their motto is like data intensive uh, biology for everyone. Uh, how many people are, are familiar with Galaxy already? Yeah, okay, maybe half of the people. So, uh, okay, well, hopefully you can still uh, get something out of the, the last part of the presentation. So uh, yeah, and another thing I like a lot is that it allows you, it allows for reproducible results. So all of the steps for your bioinformatics analysis that you're doing are, uh, are recorded in some kind of history. So like when, you, when you're on the common line and you run this already prepared pipeline, you know that your samples will go through all of the steps using the same parameters and those things. But often when you're working on your own on like your set or two or, of two, three, or maybe bigger, uh, a bunch of samples and you're doing things on the side, you're testing this and then you're tweaking parameters and you're testing something else. In the end, you get, you get results which are interesting and, and then you try to, to figure out what you did for each of the steps to arrive at this result. And well, that's, Kind of problematic because like you, you don't have a often you don't have a trace of everything unless you're very meticulous and you wrote down for each step this file I generated using these parameters and those things but if you did, didn't do that then sometimes you, you you come to the end and like you just you're trying to reproduce your results and then it takes a while to figure out what you did to reach to reach that point and like that's one <coughs> good thing about galaxy is that it remembers everything that you did so once you get your result, you can, uh, you can just go in the history and see what you did, or you can even uh, extract a workflow out of it, and then you can reapply the same workflow for the amount of samples that you want. So I, I think it's a very uh, honorable advantage. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll just talk to you uh, quickly about, uh, about Genat. So uh, Genap is this uh, Canadian computing platform for life science researchers. So it basically it, it, it leverages Compute Canada HPCs and the Canary Network to offer like all kinds of tools which are tailored for bioinformatics. So if, if you have access to uh, the Compute Canada network, uh, you, can, you can start using Genap. Uh, users can create their own private fully configured configurable galaxies, they can decide who they share this galaxy with, and they can invite co collaborators, whether they're Canadian or international, and, and, and all these people can start using, uh, using GenApp, and, and this includes, uh, yeah, as I said, Galaxy, so like, it makes it that you can run jobs using Galaxy, uh, using your Compute Canada allocation, uh, rather than uh, just waiting, uh, waiting on a, uh, on a waiting list with the, the, the public galaxy that's available online as well. So uh, it's free for Canadian Academia, and all you need is, is a Compute Canada account. Uh, there's also uh, the uh, Genap pipelines, which offer you a, a, a set of uh, pre-constructed uh, bio bioinformatic analysis pipelines. Uh, there's one for RNA-seq, RNA-seq de novo. There's one for ChIP-seq, and there's in a couple of weeks, we should have the methylation pipeline available as well. So all of the requirements for these pipelines are already installed through CVMFS at Compute Canada HPC. So like if, you're, if you have access to Compute Canada, you can, you're, you're good to go and you can start using these pipelines right away. So there's a, there's a Bitbucket site for it. So like even if you don't have access to Compute Canada resources, you want to run this on Amazon or on, in other types of resources, uh, you can still download the Mugic Pipeline's uh, uh, source code. And the, the only requirement is that you have to install the different tools and reference libraries on the, uh, the resources, that, uh, on the, the, the server that you have. But uh, in the end, the result will be the same. Uh, yeah, I was, as I was saying, there's a, the GenApp Galaxy, which is using your Compute Canada allocation to launch jobs. So 
there there's also I, I forgot to mention but like there's also a main uh, galaxy website it's called usegalaxy.org so that that's completely open to anyone so anyone can create an account and yet I, I forget how, how, how many gigabytes of, of space but like you can upload your tracks and launch analysis of of course this means like there's a lot of people using it so it, it's a uh, waiting lines are sometimes a bit long and you're limited in the amount of data that you can upload but it's free and it's uh, it works so actually so usegalaxy.org is the main one you can search online uh, just one second you, you, you can search online there's a I forget the website but there's a website listing all of the free galaxies which are open and that you can start using so I think there was this one in Florida and there's a there's a whole bunch of others so like if you if you're not lucky with usegalaxy.org because it's too slow at a point you can always try another one or something like that. Yes, you have a question. You have two choices. Uh, either you do it through the Galaxy interface or you can upload it to your Compute Canada. Uh, there's a specific folder to the, uh, for that. You can just copy it uh, like with rsync or something uh, or, or SCP in one given folder. And then there's a, there's a tool that was specifically implemented in GenApp Galaxy to take data from that directory and bring it into Galaxy. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. You can save a lot of time if you have a lot of samples to process. So uh, I'll just go quickly for, uh, if you're interested, interested in uh, getting started with GenApp Galaxy. So first thing <coughs> is you have, yes? Yes, so that, that's just what I was about to say. If you, if you are already a member of Compute Canada, you can use your login and password from Compute Canada to log into the portal. So you don't, you don't need to create a new account. Uh, so like, if you're interested and you don't have yet a Compute Canada account, the first thing I would recommend to do is to apply to Compute Canada, uh, open, open an account. The next thing that, uh, that, that will happen is once you get your Compute Canada account, you need to apply for a local a consortium. That's what I was presenting about uh, yesterday morning. You know, there's Calcul Quebec, there's West Grid, and there's like six of them. So you have to pick one. Usually, you pick the one that's the closest to your location. Okay, uh, but it, it, specifically in this case, if you want to use Genap Galaxy right now, you have to apply to Calcul Quebec because like we 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 have everything at, at uh, located there. Gradually, we're trying to roll it to other Compute Canada sites, but. Uh, Right now, if you want to use Genap Galaxy, you should apply to Calcul uh, Quebec. And then once you get access to that, you will have space and uh, allocation to start working with, uh, with, with Galaxy and other services. So that's, it's the, that's the Genap portal. You enter your Compute Canada login and password. Once you're in, uh, you'll get, well, a, a couple of options. But basically, I think what you'll be interested in is to uh, access your, uh, your, your Galaxy instance. So GenApp has this concept of project that you need to create. That's the place where you're going to, you're going to dump your data. Um, and uh, so, yeah, the, uh, the, the project gets, there's a default project that gets automatically assigned to you. So you don't even need to do that. All you need to do is to uh, instantiate for this project a, a Galaxy instance. And you create it, you wait about like, uh, I think it's 10 to maybe 30 minutes and then the the project gets, uh, the, the galaxy gets good to go. So more details on the, on galaxy. Is, is there other questions so far? Okay. So uh, to go back more specifically on galaxy. Uh, so as I was saying, a lot of the bioinformatics tools, also a lot of the, the, the tools that we've covered in this workshop so far, are available within Galaxy. So like uh, when you open Galaxy, you have this, this whole list of categories. So these are just the, the categories of sample, but like each category has a lot of tools as well. And uh, there's all kinds of stuff there from using uh, FastQC uh, and like uh, ChipSeq peak colors and, <coughs> and these kind of things up to like more simple tasks such, such as just uh, unzipping a file, converting a, a, a big bed file to a, a bed file. And, and so on. There's all kinds of, of operations you can do from the interface. So like all compute jobs are launched from a web interface and like input interface looks a bit, a bit like this. Uh, 
all of the tools in Galaxy are uh, like it's tools that are actually executed from the command line. It's just that Galaxy takes care of submitting that job for you. So like uh, the all of the parameters normally all of the parameters for the tool are available in these web interface. So like uh, uh, there's very simple ones and there's others with a lot of parameters that, so that you can customize what you want. The, the interface looks like this. I think, yeah, I think I'll have enough time to, uh, to do the, uh, the, the, the live demo, but it's just to show you there's a, there's a toolbar here with listing like all of the tools with it. And then you have the search features to quickly identify the tools, the, the tool that you might be likely to want to use. In this case, we, uh, uh, in this screenshot, it's displaying the output of a fast QC run that's been applied on a FastQ. So like instead of having to run FastQC on a server and then download the HTML locally to visualize it, well, you can just get it right away by, by clicking on, the, on, on your data set, the uh, FastQC output. And on the side here, you have your history bar. So that's, that's what I was talking about. You know, like each step that you're doing gets, gets recorded in, into Galaxy. So like each tool that I'm running will create one, where's my, okay, will create one or more of these uh, of these history uh, uh, rows, if I may say, and then you can visualize results of a, sp a specific uh, job that you launch, clicking the eye icon. And there's also this uh, this this nice feature that like you can design pipelines or or, or, or workflow if you want of steps where like. The first step will just be to select the data sets that, that interest you, and then all of the other steps will be done uh, sequentially as you go uh, without having to provide anything, because you already said, like, at this step, use the output from the previous step with these specific parameters. So, like, you get from inputting the data up to, at the end of your workflow, uh, the, uh, the output data. So, uh, again, there's a friendly GUI, a GUI for that. Where you can uh, you can modify things by hand in your workflow if you want, and maybe one last detail is that like used to be that Galaxy is not really tailored for like a medium amount of sample if I may say because like uh, every time you wanted to launch a job you need to select one sample and then uh, choose your tool select one sample execute then ch uh, choose the tool select another sample and execute. But with the newer interface of Galaxy, you can select, you can do the exact same job on a on a large amount of samples just by selecting it in the interface. So that eases things a bit. So yeah, conclusion. Uh, so in, in in this unit, we, we we've covered uh, sometimes of, of downstream analysis with epigenomic data, how to obtain publicly accessible data sets for your analysis. Um, how to assess the quality of the data that you downloaded, uh, although that was also uh, covered by uh, other modules before, um, how to visualize epigenomic data sets using online tools, and some ways to run some type of analysis with web interface. Although it's not completely over, we'll do the, the promised live demo after this. Um, and after that, the lab will provide you an, an introduction to some of the tools that we've talked about. So we'll navigate the IHEC portal to uh, download some data sets. We will execute Homer and, uh, and Great to try to identify some uh, interesting results. And we'll have it, there will be a Galaxy part also. Although I realize this lab is just one hour long, so I pretty much expect that we won't have time to, to do everything, but the Galaxy part is well, I think is well detailed. So if you if we don't have time to reach that in the lab, uh, you can uh, you can download uh, you, you you can do it on your side uh, uh, after the workshop if you want. So um, well, Anne wrote on 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 the board, but I'll, I'll try to make sure that the resources <coughs> for uh, f for this workshop, so like the server and and the Galaxy server, gets available for for a bit of time after the workshop. Of course, I, it's difficult to say that it will, will keep it indefinitely. So like, at least until Wednesday next week, things should be fine. So I would encourage you to go to your account and download your, what you produced out of the workshop locally, if that's what you want to do. 
And if we don't have time to reach the galaxy park after the workshop, maybe on your side if you're interested, like this weekend or uh, or Monday, Tuesday, you can uh, you can connect to, Gal to the, the galaxy that's uh, at the URL that's provided in the lab, and you can try that part on your side. So. And okay, so yeah, I, I provide for. For people who can't uh, have access to Compute Canada resources, uh, there, there's a, the main Galaxy, which is available here, usegalaxy.org, which, again, includes most of the tools covered in this workshop in the last two days. And, yeah, and if you're in Canadian academia, I highly recommend that you get a Compute Canada in a GenApp account. So.